Greetings and salutations, people of the internet, and welcome back to Fair Game. I want to apologize in advance for how long this particular video took to get out. Those more familiar with my channel probably saw it during my Gundam Battle Academy video on the goof. Unfortunately, in early 2022, I had to switch to a new rig specifically because my computer died. The problem is that my rig was completely incompatible with pretty much everything I used to record Snake's Revenge footage for this channel. Nestopia, FCEUX, none of them was recording footage remotely correctly. I'll get a bit more into the whys and wherefores in a bit. Where we last left off, we had reached Compound 2. It marks one of the largest difficulty spikes in the game, as well as probably some of the most dickish level design in this game. You know how for many older games, the words mandatory, stealth, or an odious combination? Well, in Snake's Revenge, you have the reverse. Mandatory loudness. Compound 2 has fragile walls that you can pinpoint with the X-ray camera and that have to be destroyed with plastic explosives. Destroying these walls will invariably sound an alarm. You're dealing with the more powerful guards now, and because your rank is starting to creep ever more upwards, the hit squads are getting larger and larger. It is painfully easy to get overrun right here, even if you're otherwise a good player at this game. Speaking of which, there's a hostage to rescue right up here. The first two doors we bypassed earlier in the level only have plastic explosives and oxygen tanks in them. Anyway, to continue about what I was talking about earlier. The two main emulators I used to record NES footage for this channel were both having major issues with recording footage for Snake's Revenge for some reason. Nestopia, no matter how I recorded it, would just invariably desync about five seconds into the video and my character would just sit around shimmying and shaking for the entire duration, making the footage basically unusable. By contrast, FCEUX did record it, but it made everything look like shit. I tried every single goddamn codec that the thing came with, and none of them worked correctly. Eventually, my boy Antipathis turned me on to using OBS, and that was how I solved the problem by not solving it. And do you see how long that one fight took? The game is throwing a choice of damnations your way. Either run the guards and lose health, or deal with them each time and have the alarm sound each time. The good news is that we get some really great items here, and the first of them that we get is the binoculars, an old staple from Metal Gear 1. They mistranslated as telescope for some reason, but it otherwise works the exact same way it did in Metal Gear 1 and allows you to look ahead of screen. Also, how's my voice quality? I'm testing a new recording microphone right now. I got it at a yard sale and it seems to be working way better than the other one did. And it's right here that we wind up getting one of Snake's Revenge's most infamous weapons. One of two weapons that Hideo Kojima likes so much he put them in future titles. The shotgun. The shotgun fires five pellets in a broad pattern, each of which does six damage. Its spread and high damage makes it basically the strongest weapon in the game, but it's always loud. And we're now coming up on the first of the two warehouses in the level. These are giant death traps. Falling off the platforms or any of the cargo docks here is instant death. Your movement here has to be pixel perfect, the slightest screw up and you die. Good news, we find another prisoner here, and rescuing him is just enough to get us a rank up. And a full heal. You full heal every time you rank up, which is good to know for an emergency. If I seem excited to show you everything in this level, it's only because I have played through this area about 50 times during the recording crisis just trying to get stuff to work. Beginning to end, I think the whole thing took me about three months. One thing I have found particularly interesting about Snake's Revenge is its development history. Production of the game took less than a year, which is almost unheard of for the NES era. As I understand it, they essentially reverse-engineered the original Metal Gear's engine into a format that would work specifically on the NES. While obviously it wasn't official, Kojima was very impressed with it, and he called it very true to the Metal Gear concept. Alrighty, now we're getting to some of the big nonsense in this level. This particular room has two walls you have to destroy, one guard in the middle, and more guards that will come flooding in. And yet, we're not to the part that's the most dickish design in the whole area yet. The next area leads to a dead end, which in turn has a hidden route that leads to a side-scrolling area. There are two of them in Compound 2. Both of them are awful. The good news is that both of them are also mercifully short. There's also a single room here where we can restock on Claymore Mines, which are otherwise kind of limited in where you can grab them, so we're gonna restock. One thing I really like about Snake's Revenge's arsenal compared to Metal Gear's is that there's no redundancies. They essentially fuse the rocket launcher and remote control missile into one weapon. The grenade launcher is gone, but in every way, the frag grenades are better. The pistol's your all-rounder, the submachine gun's good when you need to take enemies out at odd angles and don't want to raise the alarms, the shotgun's for when that no longer matters and you just want to paint in broad strokes, and all the other weapons are pretty much task-based, they do their job as well as the originals or better. The only one I'm really not fond of is the flare gun, because it's not a weapon. 
and to prove my point, we'll use frag grenades to blow open the entrance and deal with the guards that come out afterwards. Proving, once again, how much better the grenades in this game are than in Metal Gear. The door to the right of the Claymore room does not actually open from the outside. It is an exit door from the side-scrolling area. That's actually a new thing that is kind of unique to Snake's Revenge. I remember Metal Gear doing it periodically, but nowhere near as much as Snake's Revenge does, having one-way doors. Interestingly, after getting off the train and winding up in Compound 2, you're actually past the final point of no return in this game. From this point onwards, any item that you miss and absolutely need, you can just go back and get. Obviously, if it's from earlier in the game, you can't go back and get it. So if you miss the flare gun or the x-ray camera, well, too bad. But anything else, from the point of the train onwards, you absolutely can go back and find if you, for some reason, missed it. Amusingly, the game actually takes steps to prevent you from softlocking yourself. One item that you can acquire late game is the backpack. It doubles the amount of mines and missiles that you can carry. With this item, you actually don't need to be any higher than rank 3 in order to have the requisite number of mines and missiles for the last couple of bosses. Rather clever way of idiot-proofing that particular thing, actually. Proceeding onward, we wind up in one of the most obnoxious side-scrolling areas in this entire game, and that is saying something. This particular side-scrolling area is one where you have to actively try to avoid not sounding the alarms in an area where the enemy encounters are specifically designed to make them as easy to sound as possible. Compounding this problem, you have the fact that you're now rank 4. The higher the rank that you go, the larger the hit squads, and we are already at the point where you have 8 or more people that you have to deal with every time the alarms are sounded. And we are almost at the point where the variant hit squads start showing up. Appropriately enough, the side-scrolling areas are the very first area that they show up. The first ones actually show up in the very next side-scrolling area after this. Curiously, that is something that Snake's Revenge has that Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake doesn't. In fact, the first Metal Gear game to take full advantage of it after Snake's Revenge was Metal Gear Solid 2. It's one of many reasons I believe that Snake's Revenge's legacy is significantly more important than most Metal Gear fans are willing to admit. Coming up here, we have one of the most fiendish traps in the entire game. This camera comes down to a certain degree so that if you're crawling, it won't see you. However, you have to wait for it to go back up, because if you don't and you try to rush the hole so that you can slip down, it will catch you during that brief moment where Snake stands up. If you notice, a lot of the things that are responsible for Snake's Revenge's difficulty are slowly starting to tighten together. Supply rooms are few and far between. You're encountering enemies who are much better at pursuing you in areas that are much better to enable that pursuit. The hit squads, when you sound the alarm, are getting noticeably larger, enough to offset the health bonus and ammo bonus you get for ranking up. The maps are being set up where you have to trigger alarms, or it will be very difficult for you not to. The game, as we say, is no longer screwing around. The good news is that it has enough mercy to occasionally throw random rations when you beat the crap out of people, like that one we just got. Coming up ahead, we actually run into the very first time that Jennifer contacts you in Snake's Revenge. You can actually get in touch with her earlier, over in Compound 1, but this is the first time she contacts you. There's an interesting little feature in Snake's Revenge that most people probably miss, and that's that when the alarms are sounded, you can't use the transceiver. The main problem, of course, is that you barely use the transceiver over the course of regular gameplay compared to the original Metal Gear. I think that's actually one of the biggest failings of Snake's Revenge, is that it doesn't use it nearly as much as it could, when it is, for the most part, a step up in every regard. The presentation's better, it's the first one in the series to actually have portraits. So I'm left to wonder, while I farm ammo for the shotgun, was that due to time constraints? Because, as I covered earlier, Snake's Revenge had an absolutely breakneck development cycle. From concept to full game in less than a year, which is unheard of in the NES era. I understand that a big reason they were probably able to do this is because Konami literally put one of their better teams on it. It was the team they normally use for Castlevania 3. But it is something that's worth considering. Right now, we have every single weapon in the game except for one. So, let's fix that. The final weapon in the game is an old friend from Metal Gear 1. Landmines. They're anti-tank mines in this case. They do 9 damage, which is the same damage as a Claymore Mine or a Frag Grenade. And like all the explosive weapons in Snake's Revenge, it actually has a blast radius now. The biggest advantage it has over the Landmines of old, however, is that it is specifically designed for countering armored targets in this game. If nothing else works at killing it, you can usually bet that the Landmines will. It's kind of weird getting these so late in the game, considering the fact that they were one of the earliest pickups in the original Metal Gear. 
We're actually almost to the end of Compound 2, but this area is going to go out with a bang. Quite literally, it's going to demand that we blast through another wall, because of course it is. Once we're past that, and deal with the subsequent alarms, we have to make our way into another warehouse, navigate another series of docks, and this time solve a puzzle. See, there are two exits to the upcoming warehouse, and only one of them leads to where you actually have to go. If you go to the wrong one, it will unceremoniously dump you out at the door right next to the landmine room. Which is also where you'll end up if you take the exit from the side-scrolling area that is under the other stack of sandbags. Blowing those up, of course, sounds another alarm, unless you already had sounded the alarm previously, in which case nothing happens. That is why I did not even bother engaging that patrol. The second side-scrolling area of Compound 2 is nowhere near as bad as the first one. It's much more procedural. Take it nice and slow and make sure that you don't sound the alarms. There are two quirks about it, however. If you sound the alarm and subsequently try to rush it, you are going to absolutely get reamed. Bomb shoots, electrocutors, all stuff that's intended to make sure that you burn off all of your resources if you're not careful. This side-scrolling area is also where the very first variant hit squads show up, specifically for the last two screens. The second to last screen has anti-tank troops if the alarms are sounded. These guys have rocket launchers. The last one, meanwhile, has grenadiers if the alarms are sounded. Later on, you can also encounter the Grenadiers as hit squads in the top-down segments. They do 3 damage a hit in the side-scrolling areas and 5 damage a hit in the top-down areas. The Grenadiers also have about twice as much HP when you're engaging them in the top-down segments. Interesting side note, do you know that the side-scrolling areas in this game were directly inspired by the game Russian Attack? Konami made that one too. It was a pretty good game for the era if you didn't mind something arcadey. I mostly remember the soundtrack being great on the NES version. As you can see, a lot of this side-scrolling area is familiar territory, gunning through electrocutors and trying to avoid sounding the alarms. We haven't had to use oxygen tanks in a while. That's always a good sign. We're actually shockingly close to the end of this particular section. However, there is one last obstacle we have to circumvent after this side-scrolling area. Namely, this game is about to throw one more boss your way. There's only seven bosses in Snake's Revenge, and three of them are all at the game's end. So, this is the last major boss before the end of the game. This particular boss is essentially a remix of one that was in Metal Gear 1. It's named for an actual Israeli infantry fighting vehicle that was used during the 1980s and is based off the Centurion chassis. The one in Snake's Revenge kind of looks like one, except instead of a machine gun nest, it has an actual cannon turret. This boss is notable because it tends to be very much all or nothing. Basically, anything it does will instantly kill you. Getting run over by it will kill you instantly, and its cannon will also kill you instantly. As will falling off the bridge. In this regard, it is basically an extremely high-speed version of the tank battle from the first Metal Gear. As was the case last time, you need landmines to defeat it. 18 mines are needed to put this thing down for good. This particular boss can actually be really tricky at times. Sometimes the randomization just doesn't work your way, and it just will continually refuse to go where you need it to. Other times, it will just bulldoze right into where you're going before you're ready and kill you instantly. Thankfully, we got a pretty good rhythm going here, and we take out the Nagmachan without too much trouble. And with this, we have successfully defeated what is arguably the hardest leg of this game. I hope to have the next part of this run out sooner rather than later. We'll see how my work schedule coincides. 